I just want to take a few seconds, uh, or a few minutes here to talk about types of trials. I think we all have different ideas of what trials are, and the word trial has been uh, thread through the gutter in a few instances, and deservedly so, in some circumstances. So there's some things I'd like to dispel on kind of how we think about trials, how we march ideas and concepts through, through the system so that things can actually get to patients. So the first thing we all think about is when we think about trials, we think about trials for medicines, right? And that's the typical thing that most people seem to be interested in. But those aren't the only kinds of trials we do. We do trials of tests. We have trials that figure out if scans actually tell us what they need to tell us before we use them in patients. We have blood tests. We talked about these liquid biopsies earlier today. Those are really largely unproven, and the way to prove them is to actually have patients with that diagnostic information participate in trials where they got that information and didn't, and see at the end of the day that it actually helped them. And then similarly, a tissue test. We do biopsies all the time. We're testing all these markers, and we discover new markers. But oftentimes, that can be very biased, and they can lead us down the wrong path. So we need to test those as well. I'm not going to talk so much about trials of tests today. I'm really going to talk more about those next. So the first kind of trial you all you might hear about is something called a phase one study. And the fundamental goal of a phase one study is to determine if something is safe to give to all and at what dose. So that is the only goal, all right? And that, those are the trials that you know what you're getting, you know the dose you're getting, no one, there's no subterfuge of any kind of this is a placebo or this, that, and the other, because really the goal is to see how safe it is and if we can find a dose that will work. And, if it, and nowadays, you know, we cheat a lot on these trials. We don't just take random patients with all sorts of diseases or even healthy people and give some drug to them. What we're trying to do is write these trials in a way where, yeah, we know it's for safety, but we're also going to take a peek and look at the efficacy. So earlier, when Jen Speck was up here, she actually showed a remarkable trial that was actually a phase one study where nearly, I think, 50 or 60 percent of the patients with triple negative breast cancer and other types of cancers in that trial benefited from those PARP inhibitors. So we can write these trials intelligently, but the fundamental goal is to determine if it's safe. Some of these trials are for the first time ever being given to humans, and those can be frightening for all of us. You know, we've never given this compound to somebody, and we want to make sure that it's okay to do. And then the other way that we might use phase one studies is to decide if there's a combination that might be safe. So you take drug A over here and drug B over here, if they've never been put together in a given patient, and you can't just try it. You have to study that carefully. And oftentimes those are phase one studies. And like I said, we're moving away from this, but a lot of phase one studies in a lot of places are agnostic of the tumor type. They take random stuff, random kinds of cancers, throw them in there and see what happens. But we're trying to write these trials more intelligently. So then when we get past phase two, we do something called a phase two, phase one, we get to a phase two study, and now this is, we know it's kind of safe, but how well does it actually work? So these are studies that continue to accumulate safety data. I can't impress that upon you enough. We still want to know that what we're doing is safe, because as we expand it to larger and larger amounts of patients, things that only happen to one in a hundred patients are not going to be picked up in the study with 20 people in it, right? You just didn't see it often enough. But when you start getting 100 or 200 patients in a phase two study, there's a point in which you can say, okay, there's still some safety issues going on. These are oftentimes nowadays randomized. I personally kind of disagree with the study design. I think it's cheating too much, but that's sort of a, just an opinion. But really, what they oftentimes do is they randomize it versus a standard of care, something that everybody's doing, and then compare it to this to see if there's any real difference there. And then there's alternative experimental schedules we'll sometimes randomize into. So here's this pill, and it can be given as an IV, and maybe the pill works better than the IV, we don't know, and it's given with some other drugs as well. So maybe we'll test those two different schedules to see which one is a little bit better, and we'll continue to accumulate safety data. But then the one that we all think about and hear about, the one that the FDA talks about, are these phase three studies. Is it better than whatever we've been doing? All right. And this, these are large studies, and the, the fundamental goal in these styles, beyond safety as well, is to see if it treats the cancer better. And by better, that's a very nebulous term. Better can mean people live longer, better can mean the tumor is killed faster, but better can also mean it doesn't hurt people as much as what we were doing. So there's a lot of different ways you can engineer, engineer a phase three trial. So is it fun? again, is it safer than whatever we've been doing but works about the same? And so, for example, I'll just give you an example of a trial we have right now. We have a phase three study in early stage breast cancer where we actually, in these patients, the standard of care, though a little bit toxic, renders patients 98% free of their particular disease at five years. But it involves chemotherapy. So now we have a biologic drug that we're randomizing patients to. It's very hard for us to improve on 98 or 99% for these women. But what we can do is take away the toxicities. 
So that, you know, that's an example of a safety study that's actually a phase three trial. And these are, again, very large trials, and large means expensive. And oftentimes, these are not trials that we can do as individual cancer centers. So we either team up with each other in these large consortiums, or alternatively, a company might say, we have a drug we really want to see approved in this space. We're going to support this trial. These things can um, run hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think the record setter may be the Affinity trial, which is a HER2 trial in early stage breast cancer. And just my back of the envelope calculation suggests to me this might be a one and a half billion dollar trial. Mm -hmm. So these are really expensive studies. Mm -hmm. And then again, these are trials that are written to register with the FDA that leads to an approval. So from the MD scientist point of view, these are the things we want to make sure that what we're doing is absolutely safe. We must not be biased. We cannot assume something's going to work better than the standard of care. The minute we do that, we start cheating and looking at the way we look at the data. So oftentimes, because of that, we're, these are randomized studies, right? I don't know what you're getting. You don't know what you're getting. And at the end of the day, we're going to take the blinders off and figure out if something works. And most of the time, we're writing these trials in a way that we do get the answer we want, but not 100% of the time. So we still need to do these kinds of studies in this very vigorous way. And they're super complicated. There's regulatory and oversight. We spend a lot of our money and effort and time. I, all of us as investigators get these forms every day where we're just signing off on toxicities and things. They're incredibly expensive to run. There's nowadays tissue and specimen requirements. Uh, and then there's also this issue of how we monitor the disease. So we have to have imaging standardization across centers as well. So a lot of coordination from our side. And the other thing I think we've made out in the distant past uh, was that the FDA was somehow against us. Right? That's actually not true, and more so now than ever. The FDA takes this charge of not only being the US regulatory approval agency, but they're actually the approval agency for the world. There are a lot of countries that can't afford this type of service to make sure drugs are safe. And more often than not now, companies and investigators meet with the FDA up front and say, what are the requirements that we need to show you to make sure that this is safe and something that's effective that crosses the finish line? And more often than not, when you see a drug kind of not get there, it's probably because we didn't communicate carefully enough with the FDA. So the FDA, good folks. We just got to work with them. All right, so from the patient's view, who gets helped by this? Sometimes it's the patient. You know, sometimes it's other patients. It's oftentimes society at large. And unfortunately, sometimes the CEO of the drug company as well. So you know, you just have to ask that question from your perspective. Does this benefit me? Can it benefit me? Can it benefit others? And you make the judgment call on whether or not that trial is right for you. So in just sort of a spectrum, Phase one studies typically don't offer a lot of benefits to the patient. Uh, we're still learning about these drugs. The safety, there's a lot more risk in some ways in those trials. Whereas the phase three, we really, if you do get randomized to the new drug, we do expect to see benefit for you, but sometimes you're not randomized to the new drug. So this is kind of the spectrum of what kind of risk you're, about, you're willing to engender to achieve a particular outcome. So with that, I'm gonna move over to Aaron, Aaron and introduce you. Aaron, do you have slides? Perfect. So Erin is the breast medical director of the Swedish Cancer Institute, uh, or one of the medical directors there. She's also an appointed faculty member at the University of Washington. I've known you for a long time as well, and we share a lot of patients. You know, in the spirit of collaboration, uh, Swedish is a very large cancer center as well. They see a lot of patients, and with the University of Washington, one of the things we like is if we have a trial that we think is good for a patient, that patient can come over here in the same way. We'd like to send patients over to Swedish for things that they have that we might not have, and that's really the ideal circumstance. So, good afternoon. Thank you for all bearing with us during the lunch hour. Um, can you come to the stage? So, I'm here representing the Swedish Cancer Institute, and we heard earlier today that the vast majority of patients are actually treated outside of academic centers. About 85% of patients are treated in the community. The Swedish Cancer Institute is not exactly a community facility. We're sort of a hybrid between academic efforts and community care. Um, and very few of these patients actually end up on clinical trials. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking to you about what the Swedish Cancer Institute is doing to try and change itself as an organization. Um, to approve a parole to these trials. And I thought I'd start with a little bit of history. So, the Swedish Tumor Institute, as it was first known, opened in the 1930s. It was predominantly a facility um, 
where patients could come to seek radiation therapy for their tumors. As you probably all know, uh, the field of modern combination chemotherapy really did not exist until about the 1960s or 70s. And in particular for um, breast cancer, modern chemotherapy really didn't exist until the 70s. Tamoxifen um, uh, really started coming into use in the late 1970s. So I like to think that we were Johnny on the spot. Um, we joined the Southwest Oncology Group um, in 1971. That's one of the large cooperative organizations that runs clinical trials. Five years later, we were awarded the NIH grant, allowing us to fund uh, SWAG here in the Pacific Northwest. And I think we ended up funding some of the efforts through the uh, then uh, University of Washington. Um, since then, we've enlarged our network very substantially. We now have an organization called an NCORP, and that's an organization of community oncology research facilities throughout the Pacific Northwest. And I'll show you a map um, in a little bit. That's the uh, 2014 um, bullet point up there. Dr. Gary Goodman is the PI in that effort, and it's an NIH-sponsored cooperative group of community oncology um, organizations. And this actually spans now from Alaska down to the southwest of this country. What else have we accomplished? We implemented um, commercial trial programs in the 1980s. We have uh, solidified the regional um, oncology network within other organizations here in the Swedish community, here in the King County community. Um, we have opened an innovative therapeutics unit, which is designed for um, phase one uh, trials or other clinical trials that just opened up this past spring, and it's a beautiful new facility. Um, we're actually still recruiting for a director, if anyone knows of someone who'd like to be a phase one director. Um, and then lastly, um, through Dr. Brown's effort, we've launched the Personalized Medicine Research Program. Um, another way of looking at it, I think the important things on this slide that have impacted my work include the breast cancer registry. In 1995, we started cataloging all patients who come through our system who've had breast cancer so we can track all sorts of endpoints. For example, um, we recently looked at post-mastectomy radiation and women who have one to three nodes. Um, I think many of us in the field feel that the um, Lancet meta-analysis may have exaggerated benefit, and that's certainly what our review has suggested. We have a couple of presentations coming up at San Antonio in December on that issue. So that's been a very valuable resource to mine. Um, we've also um, consolidated work at Issaquah and also brought the Edmonds group into our group. Um, what else? So on this slide, we have affiliated with um, CRAB, which is a statistical office. Um, for the purpose of clinical trials, you want to be sure that your statisticians have reviewed your concepts and your trials because if you ask questions that you cannot feasibly answer with the number of patients you may be able to accrue, you've wasted a lot of time and energy. So statisticians are a critical part of the um, research mechanism. We've also implemented two um, computerized system, SIAPS, which is part of the personalized medicine platform IT um, department, and VLOPS, which will be the organization that we use for our NCORP to capture the data on those trials. So this is a schematic of our organization. All the green dots are the NCORP organizations. Uh, personalized medicine, I think, is in blue, and then the regional Scion sites are in purple. Okay, so I'm actually going to skip ahead and come back to what trials we have. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what it's like to be a PI. 
maybe some of the other uh, presenters would like to talk about this too. I'm a PI uh, principal investigator on approximately 12 protocols at the Swedish Cancer Institute. And when I was reviewing this slide, I had this comical image of myself being that little red dot in the middle running like a rodent on a wheel because there is just a tremendous amount of work and responsibility that goes into being a PI. Um, having said that, it, it's how we it, it, it's how we support the trials that eventually bring the research um, to you all in the community, including the metastatic breast cancer community. So in brief, um, sometimes it will be an investigator-initiated trial. The concept will come from within. Nowadays, much of the time, the, the protocols are brought from big pharma. Um, after that, we have to be sure that it really fits into our schematic. We need to know that it um, fits our needs as an institution. So we have a group that reviews the protocols and how it dovetails with our interests. Um, then we get into the nitty gritty, like the IRB approval, making sure that the dollars <coughs> add up, obviously budgetary issues. Um, studies open, we start enrolling. and. Um, as became mentioned, every day on my desk I have, I don't know how many folders, 10 folders where I have to sign off on data, possible adverse events, and you know, it, it, it's critical that all of this data be captured, submitted quickly. I think all of us want to be sure that the research is uh, not only reported but transparent. Um, then it gets reported to the FDA and eventually gets reported in the form of an abstract or a publication. So let me go back to what we have locally, uh, Swedish. So this is a schematic that one of our research coordinators put together. And the portion that is outlined is um, the portion that's dedicated to advanced metastatic breast cancer. Um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I can just reserve some of this for questions, but as you can see, we look at patients who are either HER2, HER2 negative, HER2 positive, or HER2 negative, ER positive, ER negative, BRCA positive, BRCA negative. Um, I'll make a pitch, though, for anyone in the room who has metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer. We have four trials open at the bottom. I think we've already heard about Sophia, her, her two prime, Monarch, her, and Hermione. Um, all of these protocols require patients to have progressed through both um, Progetta and through Catsyla. And you may have seen from our previous uh, presenter that the average woman will stay in remission for about 30 to 36 months on, um, on Progetta and for Ketsyla it's around a year. So we're just now getting to the point where patients might have progressive HER2 positive disease and be a candidate for these trials. Some of them are extremely exciting. Two of them um, are small molecules that do penetrate into the CNS and they're open to patients who have brain metastases which as many of you um, know, if you have that condition, is um, a real issue for her two positive disease. Um, what other trials are exciting? We've talked about the MATCH trial. The MATCH trial is what we call a basket trial, and it is a very exciting opportunity. It is very challenging to match a patient who may have an actionable mutation. You know, the obvious mutations that patients have in breast cancer are not subject to um, these novel drugs and the match drugs. They're looking for things that are kind of off the beaten track um, when it comes to managing breast cancer. Um, frankly, what I've done for patients who might be interested is done the um, MGS testing as a prelim screening to see if perhaps they have an actionable mutation on this protocol before starting. The wheel's going for that protocol. It, it's not easy to um, accrue to. 
Uh, for triple negative, we've been very busy with the metric trial that's a conjugated antibody against a protein that's overexpressed. In some patients who have triple negative breast cancer, the motivation trial at the bottom opens next week, and that will be a trial for patients who are triple negative but androgen receptor positive, looking at the combination of paclitaxel and enzalutamide. So we, we are trying to build it, um, so you will come. Time is up. Okay. Um, and there are additional trials that are open through the end mechanism, which I didn't go into today. So, um, I uh, I did make slides, and uh, we're short on time, and we want to get any questions in. Um, we have a few minutes. We're, we started late. Um, so, just since the, the session is understanding clinical trial opportunities, I want to make sure it's said um, probably the best site that's kept up to date that's broad is the National Cancer, uh, National Institutes of Health, clinicaltrials.gov. So it's just clinicaltrials, all the space, space.gov, G-O-V, G -O -V, for government. And you can have put in breast cancer, you can put in what stage, you can even narrow it to location if you want. So that's a good site. And there are some breast cancer specific um, sites that list breast cancer trials, but um, I think there's breastcancertrials.org, but they don't um, they don't have all the trials. So I think clinicaltrials.gov is probably the best. I think you know asking your oncologist if there are trials that you would be eligible for is the best way to start, and um, and then uh, considering a second opinion, especially at a time of progression when it's time to make a decision about what to go on next, because most trials, most, not all, you can't enroll unless you currently have visible disease that's progressing. So that's the time that most trials would, would take you on board. So that's the time to consider a second opinion. Um, and I know a big frustration for patients is the eligibility. Like it looks like that a trial is available for your type of cancer after the number of lines of therapy you've had, and then your liver function is a little abnormal, or your white count is a little too low, and that's really frustrating. And, and there is an effort to loosen that up a bit when it's not critical. Um, we do need to say, you know, a little bit of an abnormal liver, liver function is probably not a big problem, but 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 if you Think of it from the, the, the group, the, usually it's a pharmaceutical company trying to get their new drug approved. Their goal is to minimize the toxicity as much as possible so that they can get the drug approved. And if you start with a little bit of abnormal liver function and then the drug contributes to that, that, can be, um, that could be a barrier to actually getting the drug ultimately approved. So they do want a group of relatively healthy patients. and. We're, I know we need to work better on the eligibility and the patient voice can really help with that with our research advocates. And I know in a few minutes we're going to have a couple of our research advocates up here talking about adding the patient voice to the design of trials, to the enrollment of trials, to the conduct of trials. And I think that's really critical and I think it's really making much more patient friendly uh, trials as well. So we'll hear about that in a minute. So I've got uh, four questions here now, and I expect more, but the first three questions, I think we can each tackle one apiece. So I'm going to hand this first one to Aaron, which is with two major academic institutions, and I would argue it's not two, it's probably more than that, in Seattle, each running its own clinical trials, how can patients who get their cancer care in one satellite system get the best opportunity for them for clinical trials in either institution? So where can we find out which center we should be going to? You know, I. I think you have to feel very confident that you can work with your clinician. Um, I encourage my patients to discuss opportunities both within the organization and outside of the organization. And frankly, um, working with patients who have metastatic breast cancer is collaborative. I mean, these, these patients are frankly, very dear to me, we become very close. And I think that's the sort of um, relationship that you should strive for. I am always happy to send a patient for another opinion. 
I usually am pretty well attuned to what um, options are available in the SCCA. I hope that I hope that's true also in reverse. Um, in terms of looking for trials, there was one thing that I found recently that I thought was sort of fun and interactive. If you've been on the MBC Alliance website, they now have a bubble plot where you can um, put in your particular situation, ER positive, HER2 um, positive, or triple negative, and they have bubbles that represent the nature of the trial and how many patients they're accruing. And it's really, you can click on them and read more about it. It's, sort of a fun interactive option. So Julie's got a good question. So the question BK assigned to me is when do we expect to open immunotherapy trials for ER positive <laughs> metastatic breast cancer? Um, so it's not, it's not being studied in the early stage. We have done phase one trials of the immune checkpoint inhibitors that we've talked about and with essentially no hint of activity for many of these drugs in the ER positive, and we picked out triple negative is where we're seeing these early responses, and that's why many of these drugs are being further explored in triple negative. It's not that we haven't tried these drugs, you know, in, in small groups of every kind of breast cancer and beyond. It's we, we just aren't seeing that that approach by itself is effective. Now, Dr. Desis did show you um, a trial that the tumor vaccine group has open, and they have their own website, by the way. They have a great website that lists what trials are open and everything. Um, and uh, they did have a trial for both triple negative and ER positive that was a, a vaccine trial. Um, we are looking at other um, targets, too, that some, a subset of ER positive breast cancer might express, and then we can try to exploit you know, uh, antibodies and, and toxicity that, that regulate, that stimulates the T cells, et cetera, for those targets. But um, we're trying to find targets that span all breast cancer, not just ER positive or triple negative or, or HER2 positive. But to date, that general category of the immune checkpoint inhibitors is such a home run for lung cancer and melanoma and kidney cancer and all. It, it has not shown much activity in ER positive. So please comment on the pace of broad access, e.g. approval, to a drug with the complexity of need to test combo therapies slowly and with multiple arms, and then also personalized medicine and very specific entry criteria subgroups. So these questions are actually linked. I, I, I think I know who wrote this question. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you think about the problem like this, so we are lumpers and splitters in biology and medicine. And if you lump, you know, you just call it triple negative hormone positive HER2. If you split, you call it triple negative with a <coughs> mutation with compensatory this, that, and the other, and you get very precise. And so the thing is, if you're writing a clinical trial, you want the best possible patient for that trial to make sure your idea succeeds. But if I have one of those patients and out of my 1,200 patients in my practice, and then Erin's got one in her 1,200, and I need to study this in 100 people, you guys figure this out. This, this is challenging, right? So this is where we need to cooperate. And so what we do is things like the MATCH study, for example, where we might be able to sequence patients around the country, maybe even around the world, and say, these are the best candidates. And then we've collaborated with the drug companies on the other end, saying, you guys give us access to whatever molecules you think express a modicum of safety and some efficacy, and let us have access to it. And we will match those patients with those mutations wherever they are. And that might be the best path forward. Now that's hypothetical. We're doing that now. The early experience with that strategy didn't work, but one could argue we just didn't have enough molecules, didn't have good testing. So as we continue to find this, this is what we're doing. But this is expensive too. You can imagine how hard it is to do this. And the last thing we want to do is spend a lot of resources and efforts to open a beautiful trial for which we can only get one patient in our community. Right? So we have to work together to figure this out. And I think that's, I think if anything, in terms of research, I hope you're getting a sense of collaboration even amongst different cancer centers. So I got another question as well here, um, which is about, and I think I'm gonna lump this under the rubric of sort of natural therapies. Are there any trials for Rick Simpson oil, RSO, made with marijuana? And you know, in Seattle, marijuana takes care of a lot of problems. <laughs> but really, I mean, this falls under natural therapies. And 
natural therapies have, for a variety of reasons, been outside of the purview of what academic positions have been able to get to. For one, with things like marijuana, we couldn't even test it, right? Like, well, not until recently. And there's still federal mandates not permitting us to do so. The other end of the spectrum also is that even in sort of generalized natural therapies, these are not regulated things. So this batch of this thing from this supplier is distinctly different than this batch of this thing from that supplier. And until they get on board and kind of standardize, it's very hard for us to test things when you know we're comparing apples and oranges. So there's that general problem, I think, in this field. Having said that, things that work for a thousand years from people, there's probably something there. And we gotta be not elitist about it and respect that and respect those ideas and try to capture those molecules and study them in a meaningful way as well. I don't know if you guys have different ideas on those things. Absolutely. So please come up. Even when you find a clinical trial, the institution exclusion criteria is often hard to decipher for patients. Are there organizations that help bridge this gap? Yeah. Yeah. I know of some, but I'll pass the baton on here. Well, I mean, sometimes they flummox me too. I mean, often when I think I have a perfect patient for a trial, I read the fine print and I realize I made the mistake of putting them on tamoxifen for a little while and they had to be off all therapy. I mean, any possibly effective therapy, for example, for the MASH trial that happened recently. So, um, it, it's a challenge. I, you know, I think you can look at the sites that I've mentioned um, in the handout that I've distributed. There are a couple of sites that you can look at just as a preliminary screening. After that, um, I think you're going to have to rely on your oncologist and the regional research centers to review. I mean, we have people fax in their records for review and make sure that they're eligible before they make the community. So we have time for one more question, which I think is a remarkably important I think there are better response on this one. Okay. There's actually, there's, has anybody checked out Cancer Commons? They were great in helping me do some recent analysis of sites, and they, I don't know who they are or what they do, but they came up with four or five trials, three of which I found myself, two which I had, and then provided me the opportunity to get the free service. And it was much easier to navigate the medicine of breast cancer trials, so we were able to read through 174 trials and institute my chief scientist to tell me what all the drugs did and things like that, right? So they were <coughs> it was free, and it's started by some guy who participated in their phase one trial, which failed. He happened to be the guy that it was successful for. So and he believes that he, people should have access to trials, and I think it's a great resource, and it's free. Can you say it can help? Cancer Commons. Cancer Commons. And before we finish up this session, Julie had an incredibly basic question put in front of her, and this just shows how sometimes we gloss over things. Right. So the question is, and I probably generated it because I said that, um, can you explain what a line of therapy is? And basically, we, we do use a lot of terms and jargon that we just assume everybody else knows. A line of therapy is each different therapy you've gotten. So the first treatment you got for your metastatic disease is your first line of treatment. And then the next treatment you went on is your second line. And then the next is your third line. And where it gets a little gray with eligibility is if you go back to the treatment you had before, but that's another story. So a lot of trials, the eligibility says you can only have had one prior line of therapy for metastatic disease. Uh, meaning you can have only had one prior therapy. And sometimes it's you can only have had one prior line of chemotherapy, but all the endocrine therapy you want, for example. So that's what a line of therapy 